Hi, everybody. So, uh, yeah, we are happy to have today uh, Mary Wooter from Stanford who will tell us about uh, list decoding uh, of random of random linear codes, I guess. We'll see. <laughs> right, thanks, Avi, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, yeah, so I'm today going to talk about uh, thresholds for random subspaces, uh, aka uh, LDPC codes achieve list decoding capacity. Um, so the title of the talk could be either one, uh, and I'll explain what these have to do with each other in a moment, and also hopefully eventually define some of these words, although not, not too much. And this is based on joint work with Jonathan Mosheth at CMU, Nick Resch at CWI, uh, Nogaran Zui at Haifa, and Shafswat Silas at Stanford. Um, okay, uh, and, and also please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions at any time, because otherwise I'm just standing here all by myself in my office and it's very sad. Um, okay, uh, so what is this talk about? Um, so this talk is about combinatorial properties of random subspaces over finite fields and some applications to error correcting codes. So I'll go into a little bit more detail in a moment about the types of combinatorial properties that I'm interested in, but think of these as properties like no 10 points in my uh, random subspace are too close together or something like that. In particular, these are properties that are very likely to be satisfied by low dimensional subspaces and they're very unlikely to, to be satisfied by high dimensional subspaces. And I'm kind of interested in what, what is that threshold between when they're very likely to be satisfied and, and very unlikely to be satisfied? What is that threshold dimension? Um, so the, the plan for the talk is that first I'm going to give, uh, I guess, a quick introduction to these. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, what are these combinatorial properties that I'm interested in, a little bit about what's known about them, and I'll wave my hands about uh, what they have to do with error correcting codes, although I'm not going to go into too much detail in the coding theory front. So if you're not into coding theory, hopefully you'll, you'll still uh, enjoy this talk because everyone loves random subspaces over finite fields. Um, uh, I'm also going to give um, sort of the, our, our main result is, uh, our main technical result is a characterization of what properties are satisfied with high probability by uniformly random subspaces of a particular dimension. So these are what, what properties within a particular class of properties uh, are satisfied with high probability by uniformly random subspaces of a particular dimension. So we'll be able to sort of pin down what this threshold is in terms of the property. Um, and then the, the reason that we cared about such a characterization, which I'll tell you about at the end of the talk, is an application to low density parity check or LDPC codes. Um, basically what this application is, is people have worked pretty hard to establish that certain combinatorial properties like the ones I care about hold for uniformly random subspaces. The buzzwords here are like list decoding random linear codes and, and stuff like that. And what we show basically is that all of those results in a completely black box way can carry over to much more structured random subspaces, in particular to subspaces that come from something called Gallagher's ensemble of low density parity check codes. And so this establishes um, in particular uh, that LDPC codes achieve list decoding capacity, which was the second title of the talk, um, and also sort of a whole host of other uh, nice combinatorial properties about these codes that we didn't already know. So you can say, uh, instead of Gallagher uh, ensemble, you can say that the subspaces, uh, you know, their kernel is spent by constant size um, vector. Exactly. Yeah. So another, yeah, I should have said, yeah, another way to see, see these, like, what is this structured family of subspaces? It's the kernel of a random sparse matrix. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. So, so that's the plan. Um, so uh, let me get started by a, sort of an introduction to what are the sorts of random or what, what are the sorts of properties that I'm interested in and I'll wave my hands a little bit about some connections to coding theory. Okay, so random subspaces over finite fields. So just to set notation for all of this talk, Blackboard F is gonna be a finite field. Um, it can be any size, uh, think of it as constant size. Um, and in particular for almost all of this talk, you can just think about it as F2. Um, we're going to be looking at subspaces of f to the n. And just a heads up throughout this talk, I'm going to draw subspaces of f, you know, some finite field to the n, like this cartoon here. So I guess the, the dots are meant to indicate that it's some discrete set. And the little plain thing here is meant to indicate that there's some linear structure. But of course, this cartoon is you know, completely misleading about the geometry. Don't think of it like this. Think of it you know, more like a subset of the hypercube. But uh, I'm going to use this picture anyway, even though it's completely misleading. So apologies up front. Okay, and then I'm gonna be interested in random subspaces, uniformly random subspaces. And when I say that, I just mean a random subspace, right? So there's finitely many of them, pick, pick a uniformly random one. Okay, 
So now that we know the objects that we're interested in, uniformly random subspaces over a finite field, we can ask some questions about them. So uh, one question, sort of a classical question uh, in coding theory, is what is the closest that any two points in this random subspace B, V can be to each other in Hamming distance? Um, so Hamming distance is just the uh, number of coordinates on which any two points differ. Right? So uh, we're asking like, well, yeah, if I have this random subspace, it's a bunch of points, I look at every single pair of points, what's the closest that any, of the, any two of those are in Hamming distance? Right? So that, that's a, a question. Um, and in particular, if I, want, if I want to say that no two points are closer than delta or something in Hamming distance, how big can I take the dimension of the subspace and still guarantee that? Um, we can ask a similar question instead of about pairs of points, about you know, L tuples of points or something. So we can ask, what is the maximum number of points of V that lie in any Hamming ball of some particular radius, like radius PN? It says maybe I'll take you know, some my Hamming ball of radius PN, I'll like move it all around the space. I'll try to capture as many uh, as many points as possible in this random subspace, and I ask, which, you know, how, how many can I possibly capture with, with such a Hamming ball? Um, and the property that I'll be interested in is not too many points can be captured with with such a Hamming ball. And once again, I'm interested in how big can the dimension of the subspace be um, before that ceases to be true with high probability. Um, okay, this is a fun game. We can keep asking questions like this. We can ask the same question with like a combinatorial rectangle. This is the one example where F2 is not the right thing to think of, but now, now think of the finite field as being somewhat larger. And then we can ask about a combinatorial rectangle like S1 cross S2 cross dot dot, dot cross Sn, um, where each Si has size at most uh, some little l, some parameter little l, which is smaller than the size of the field. And I, once again, same question. Um, what is the maximum number of points that lie in this combinatorial rectangle and or lie in any such combinatorial rectangle? And how big can I can I take the dimension of the subspace before it's very likely that you know a bunch of points lie in some such combinatorial rectangle? Cool. Okay, so those are a bunch of questions. Um, and uh, I think that they're interesting questions on their own, but my motivation for thinking about these questions comes from error correcting codes. So I'm gonna just wave my hands about that um, really quickly. Uh, just sort of looking at the faces that I see on the side, I expect that most people here um, already know most of the coding theory jargon, but uh, I'll define it anyway. Um, I'm not gonna formally define it, but I'll, I'll wave my hands about it anyway. Um, so, there we go. Um, so this first question that I asked about how far apart are any two points in a random subspace, in coding theory jargon, this can be phrased as what is the distance of a random linear code? <clears throat> so to define some jargon, um, a code is just a subset of f to the n, a linear code is a subspace of f to the n, and a random linear code is a random subspace of f to the n, right? So that's the random subspace part. Um, distance just refers to exactly what we said before, the minimum Hamming distance between any pair of points. Um, so then it's, it's really just sort of word for word exactly the same question that we asked before. The reason in coding theory that we care about distance is uh, if you sort of think about this set of points as a set of possible ways of encoding messages that a sender might send to a receiver, like suppose that a sender wants to send this message but then there's a little bit of noise or something in the channel between the sender and the receiver. It gets perturbed a little bit. If all of the points are pairwise far apart, that is if the code has good distance, then the receiver can sort of round back to the point that the sender meant to say and, and fix those errors. Um, so that's sort of the, the motivation from a communication perspective. Um, the reason that one in coding theory is interested in random linear codes, random linear subspaces, um, this is a pretty classical question. Uh, I think the main reason is just sort of to answer existential questions. If you're interested in like, does there exist a linear code so that thus and such a random linear code is a good thing to try. Um, and also uh, for, I guess for the same reason, it's also useful in constructions. A lot of the constructions that we have are based on, uh, you instantiate existential results for small construction, for, for some small thing that you can brute force over and then bootstrap up from that in some way. Uh, and so answering questions like this for random linear codes can, can be helpful for, um, Bigger questions. Okay, so that was this first. Uh, that that was this first question about um, just pairwise distance. Um, this next one about the Hamming ball. If you were to uh, say this in coding theoretic jargon, this is what is the list decodability of a random linear code? So we say that a code is list decodable precisely if not too many points live in any Hamming ball of a particular radius. So again, it's exactly the same question. Um, the motivation here is uh, sort of like in the communication setup. 
you imagine that there's so much noise on the channel that the receiver can't possibly hope to decode uniquely, but maybe they can restrict the answer, like restrict the, the set of possibilities to um, you know, all of the points which live in some Hamming ball. And our goal is just to reduce those numbers of possibilities or you know, minimize the number of possibilities in order to limit the confusion of the decoder. <clears throat> and so that sort of trans this Hamming ball here is like the region of confusability. And we want to con want it to contain as few legitimate code code words as possible. Um, similarly, this last question that I asked about the combinatorial rectangle, in coding theory jargon, this question is, what is the list recoverability of a random linear code? And once again, this combinatorial rectangle represents um, some kind of region of confusion for the receiver. Um, here, the error model is, is kind of like um, the receiver knows that the first coordinate lives in this set, and the second coordinate lives in that set, and the third coordinate lives in that set, and, and so on. And you want to, um, once again, minimize confusion by minimizing the number of points that could possibly live in such a combinatorial rectangle. <clears throat> so that's can sort just, of- Can you just say in one more sentence, what's the definition of uh, uh, recoverability? What does it mean? Um, li list recoverability? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess here, my cartoon is for something that's called zero error list recoverability. But what it means is that for any, uh, <clears throat> Let me actually go back to this picture. For any collection of sets, S1, S2, up through Sn, where each Si has size at most little l for some parameter little l, the number of code words or the number of points in my uniformly random subspace that is, or I guess the definition of just list recoverability for a code is the number of code words contained in any such combinatorial rectangle is no more than some parameter capital L. And if that holds, we say that it is little l comma capital L list recoverable. Does that clear it up? Uh, I think you're muted, but. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Got it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So sorry for not defining these for formally. Um, in, in uh, I thought about defining them formally, but then I realized that like the point of the talk was not actually the coding theory things. So um, I'm just waving my hands. But yeah, please do ask ask questions. Um, it's can about as formal as I'm going to get, though. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Can you explain what's the difference between the distance and the list decodability? I'm not sure. I see what's the difference between them. Ah, uh, yeah. So you can think of list decodability as almost a generalization of distance. So distance says that no two points should be too close together. Oh, okay. List decodability says no capital L points should be too close together for some parameter capital L. Okay, okay. That's uh, a generalization. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah or alternatively, you could say that um, for any Hamming ball of distances, like for any Hamming ball of radius blah, there's only one point in the in that Hamming ball. And list decodability says for any Hamming ball of radius blah, there's at most you know, 20 points in the, in the ball or something like that. Um, any other questions about about these uh, kind of hand wavy definitions? Awesome. Okay, so uh, so these questions, like I said, they're motivated by error correcting codes. They're very classical questions in error correcting codes. At least distance and, and list decodability are pretty classical notions. Uh, random linear codes are also a very classical notion. Um, so these questions have been studied a fair amount. Um, so what, what what is known about them? Um, so let, let me start with this distance one. So what is the distance of a random linear code? So this is a completely classical question um, that we understand well. And here's the answer. Um, so here, uh, I've, on this chart on the x-axis, I'm plotting the dimension of the code, or sorry, the dimension of the subspace. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, I'm actually, I'm plotting the normalized dimension. So the, the dimension of my random subspace is k, and the ambient dimension of the space is n. I'm going to plot k over n, and I'm going to refer to this as the rate um, of the subspace. So I'm, I'm going to try to present this with like as little coding theoretic jargon in, as possible, but I'm probably going to slip and call this the rate. So it's the, the rate of the code or the dimension of the subspace. So rate one means like a full dimensional subspace, very big, big dimensional subspace. Rate zero means a zero dimensional subspace. And in between, we have uh, intermediate dimensional subspaces. <clears throat> uh, on the y-axis, I have the probability that a random k-dimensional subspace has distance at least delta for some fixed delta, aka the probability that all pairs of points are at least delta n apart. And uh, what's known? Well, it's known that basically this 
when I plot this, it, it looks something like this. So there's some threshold, R star, which happens to be one minus the entropy of delta, although that doesn't really matter much for this talk. Um, so that if you look at subspaces of dimension a little bit less than R star times N, then something called the gilbert varshamov bound says that with really high probability, that random subspace will have good distance, meaning that no two points will be really close together. On the other hand, if you go a little bit above that, that dimension, so um, <clears throat> you know, R star plus epsilon times N, um, then with really high probability, there's going to be some pair of points that are too close together. So the picture looks something like this. Okay, so that's what's known about distance. How about uh, list decoding, right? So this is the question, how many points lie in a Hamming ball? Um, so here, the property that I'm interested in is no more than some number of points lie in a Hamming ball, where let's just say some number is, is like some constant that uh, depends on the radius of the Hamming ball that I'm interested in. So I'm gonna be looking at Hamming balls of radius, um, sorry, I should have said not in any Hamming ball, but in any Hamming ball of radius PN. Um, so I, I look at all the Hamming balls of radius PN and I ask, uh, is, is there such a Hamming ball that contains more than a constant number of points? Um, or, and once again, I have uh, on the x-axis is the dimension of the subspace and on the y-axis is the probability that this is the case. And the picture looks pretty similar. Um, turns out this question is a little bit harder than distance. So it, it took sort of longer to figure out, we still don't know exactly the, the right answer, hence this squiggly squiggly here. But um, basically, the, uh, the picture looks basically the same. There's some threshold rate R star, um, which is about also one minus the um, entropy of P. So that if you look at subspaces of dimension a little bit less than that, then with really high probability, there is no Hamming ball that contains more, you know, more than a constant number of points. And if you go a little bit above that, um, actually even if you go too much above it, then with probability one, there is some Hamming ball that contains an exponential number of points. Um, and uh, so the, the picture, the, the main takeaway from this slide though is that the picture looks basically the same. Okay, this is fun. We can now ask, what, what do we know about this other question, list recoverability? Like how many points lie in any combinatorial rectangle? And once again, um, so this question I think is maybe even even harder than the list decoding one, um, but this uh, the, the picture eventually looks looks pretty much the same, um, where there's some threshold rate you back off by that from a little bit, and then with really high probability, not too many points are contained in any L by L by L by L combinatorial rectangle, um, and if you go a little bit above that, then with really high probability, um, or yeah, I guess actually with probability one, um, there will be some L by L by L combinatorial rectangle that actually contains an exponential number of points. In the previous two pictures, it was the, mainly for the field of with two elements, so uh, right, and this is, uh, what is Q here, Q? Right, yeah, so list recoverability only makes sense over larger fields, um, yeah. so here think of, think of little l as being a constant, and think of Q as also being a constant, but much larger than l, like l to the 100 is a reasonable, uh, okay. yes, this is something like that. Okay. Actually, these results, uh, it, it also makes sense to think of Q as growing with N, um, if you like, although uh, the results that I'm going to tell you about today, um, don't, don't think about that. <laughs> um, but for these results, that, that, that'll work fine. Um, yeah, any other questions? Okay, so the story so far, um, like what, what have I said so far? So I asked you three questions about random linear subspaces over finite fields, these sort of basic combinatorial questions, how close are any two points, uh, how close are any L points, like in, in the sense of living in a Hamming ball, and how close are any L points in the sense of living in some combinatorial rectangle. And uh, I waved my hands a little bit about uh, wh why you might care about this from a context of coding theory, and I told you that they all have some sort of threshold behavior. Um, so what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is first, uh, I'll give you a characterization of this threshold. So it turns out that this threshold behavior um, actually is, is quite general. It holds for uh, any quote unquote local property, which I'll define in a moment. And moreover, for any such property, we can actually give a characterization of that threshold in terms of the property. Um, and then after I tell you what that property is and a little bit about why it holds, I'll mention uh, the application that we actually started caring about when we, when we started doing this work, which is um, the list decodability of LDPC codes, low density parity check codes, which as Avi said earlier, you could just think of as a 
a more structured random subspace. Instead of taking a completely random subspace, you take the kernel of a random sparse matrix. So it's, it's a very particular ensemble of, of uh, random subspaces. And basically what, our, uh, what this application shows is that sort of the results up here, the positive results. So these are the results up here are the ones that say uh, with high probability, a, a nice property is satisfied. So these, these good things, these basically carry over completely for free to these more structured random subspaces um, just using this characterization. And it's basically just gonna fall out for free from the characterization. Okay, um, so that's the plan. Uh, any questions before I get started on that? Great. Okay, so thresholds for local properties. So I need to tell you what a local property is. Um, so this is, this is what I'm calling a local property. I think there are probably some other definitions of it. This is, this is what I'm calling a, lo a local property. Um, so informally, a local property is defined by the exclusion of small bad sets. Um, so to formalize that, suppose that curly B is a collection of bad sets, B1, B2, and so on, subset of F to the N, so that a couple of things hold. So first, I want curly B to be invariant under coordinate permutations. Um, so uh, here, here's an example of, of such a curly B. So curly B is made up of uh, six, six sets, each of size two. Um, I guess this is meant to be over, uh, over F2, and I guess white means zero and blue means one or something like that. Um, and you can see that like if you take B1 or something and you apply some coordinate permutation, like maybe you switch the second and the third coordinates, you end up with um, B3. And similarly, if you were to try this with all of these examples, you'll find that you're, it's closed under coordinate permutations in that sense. Um, the other thing I want is that the size of all of these bad sets is at most some parameter little b for all, uh, for all the bad sets. And think of little b as being a constant. Um, in, in the context of distance and list decoding, think, think of capital B as like 2 for distance or the parameter capital L, which I didn't actually define on the slides, but like the number of points you want to live in the Hamming ball um, uh, for, um, for list decoding. Okay, so suppose we have such a collection of bad sets. So these are sets we would like to avoid in our uh, random linear subspace. And um, so then we'll define the property P sub B to be the property there is no bad set contained in my subspace. And that, that property is what I'm going to call a B local property. Right. So for example, just with, with this silly little example here, if I were to take some subspace of F2 to the four, then that subspace would satisfy this property if it contained none of these pairs of points, or uh, equivalently, if there were no X and Y in the subspace so that X is the logical negation of Y and X has weight two, which is another way of describing this um, kind of toy. Uh, so it's the same thing as a narrow CNF? Say again? So it's the same thing as a narrow CNF. I don't know what that means. What is a narrow CNF? It's a CNF for each of the, the terms is, uh, Clause whatever is narrow. So this is corresponds to your little b. Sorry, you didn't catch that. Yeah, I'm saying it's a, it's a conjunction of uh, clauses where the clauses are narrow, that they're con uh, only contain a little b oh. variable. Uh, yes. But yes. you want the symmetry here. It's, it seems to me more in analogy with just uh, triangle free graphs or uh, you know graphs that do not con contain some collection of small graphs and subgraphs, right? And it's permutation, close under permutations there as well. And so it's also classical to study threshold properties for this type of um, question. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's just the Boolean functions which involve uh, these narrow DNFs, that's why I'm mentioning this. I see, yeah. So I guess like, like Avi said, um, so for first, yes, the graph thing is a really great analogy. Um, yeah, and uh, actually our, our main result is, is sort of very analogous to the types of results one can one can prove for like thresholds and random graphs um, in, in terms of the characterization. Um, yeah, you've all, I guess, right, the, the locality, the, the B localness, I guess, sounds like it does correspond to narrow um, in that sense. But uh, yeah, there's also the symmetry property, which I guess wouldn't be satisfied by uh, you know, an arbitrary narrow CNF. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, and similarly, we usually know how to prove these sharp threshold results only for uh, graph properties. So we do need some symmetry. So it's not surprising you also need it. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
Right. Okay. So this is the, the definition of a of a local property then. Um, right. So we've already seen several examples of, of local properties. So all of the three properties that, that I cared about at the beginning, right? Distance is defined by the exclusion of pairs of points that are too close. And of course, this is closed under coordinate permutation. So if you have two points that are too close, then you scramble up their coordinates, they're still too close. Um, uh, list decodability um, is defined by the exclusion of L tuples of points that all live in a Hamming ball. And list recoverability is defined by the exclusion of L tuples of points that all live in some combinatorial rectangle. Um, so these are sort of very natural uh, lo local properties. Um, and that's mainly why we uh, came to this definition is because the, our motivating examples uh, happened to satisfy this. We actually proved this first for, uh, I guess, list decodability. And then it was like, oh, it works for anything with, with these points or with these properties. Okay, um, <clears throat> great. So local properties capture, uh, in particular, our motivating examples. Um, and uh, I guess sort of in, in analogy with, with random graphs, it's perhaps not, not too hard to believe that, that they have um, thresholds so that they, any local property is going to satisfy such a threshold behavior. Um, so that we know that there, there is some uh, threshold rate R star so that if you go back a little bit, then with really high probability, the property will be satisfied. No random subspace of that dimension, or sorry, a random subspace of that dimension is very unlikely to contain any of the bad sets. On the other hand, if you go a little bit above, um, it's very unlikely to be satisfied. A random subspace of that dimension is uh, very likely to contain a bad set. Um, and this will follow from our analysis and uh, also independently and in, in more generality um, by some work of Ben Rossman um, from 2019. Okay, so that's just the existence of the threshold. But the thing I'm interested in is uh, what does the threshold actually look like? Um, wait, that's wait, sort of. Wait. Uh, Mary, you are going to say nothing about the proof of this. Uh, what it uses, uh, you know, how it is related to proofs in uh, things that we might know for such results in graph properties or in general for monotone fun functions. So, yeah, so what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a proof of the characterization of the threshold, which will, as a corollary, show you that the threshold exists. So okay. I will prove it um, in that, or at least wave my hands at the proof in that sense. Um, in terms of, so uh, Ben Rossman has uh, another proof of like the existence of these sharp thresh or, uh, thresholds. And um, so his, his proof, uh, I think it does hold for any monotone property. Um, so it, it is more general. And I think it uses tools that are sort of similar to that of um, Bolabash uh, Tomasin results for random graphs. Yeah. Um, so basically he looks at he looks at the expansion of um, a graph that's sort of formed by the subspace lattice and uh, uses that somehow to, uh, to, to show th sharp thresholds. It's a very key proof. Um, actually, we, we didn't see it until after we had <laughs> written the paper. Um, but yeah, so that, that, that will, I think it's more of a, a more of a canonical way of, of proving that there exists a threshold. But um, as far as I know, those tools don't, don't immediately give a characterization of of such a threshold. So I'll tell you some tools that actually a really simple argument that will, will give you a nice characterization of the threshold. And, and when I say the characterization, I can also mention some relationship to graph uh, graph properties as well. Um, and that that argument also just sort of immediately gives uh, gives a threshold like this quantitatively about the same strength as, as Rossman's. OK. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah. well, I'll wait for what you show. <laughs> then okay. I'll ask some more. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I will, I will show you what the threshold is, and as a corollary, it exists. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm basically going to explain this characterization, this threshold by example, pretty much. Um, and so, just for simplicity, for this example to work, um, <clears throat> let's just assume that every one of my bad sets has size exactly b, and also has dimension b. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, hmm. Um, and also has dimension B. So I, uh, there, these are all full rank sets. And this turns out to be completely without lots of generality. Um, I'm also going to assume that the size of the field is two. The, the only reason that I'm assuming this is um, so that I don't have to have another parameter that I'm carrying around through the slides. That's literally the only reason. It works fine for FQ uh, as long as Q is a constant. Um, and uh, I'm also going to assume that my bad, my collection of bad sets curly B contains only one orbit under coordinate permutation. Um, and that that is with loss of generality and I'll amend it in a moment. 
Um, so, but let's, let's assume that uh, curly B just sort of looks like this. So it's just a single orbit of uh, fully, uh, you know, full rank B sized sets um, that are, uh, you know, a single orbit under coordinate permutation. Okay. So given that, um, what's like the first thing we would try to understand what is this threshold? Like the first thing we'd try uh, is probably like a, a first moment attempt or something like that, right? So we have some random k-dimensional subspace and I want to upper bound the probability that there exists a bad set in this random subspace. So the first thing we should do is let's compute the expected number of bad sets in this random subspace and hope that it is small. There's a see, see what, how we need to take the parameters for that to be really small and if that if the expected number of bad sets in my random subspace is really small, then by Markov's inequality, it's really unlikely that such a bad set exists. Okay, so let's do this exercise. All right, so first let's uh, look at a fixed bad set B. What's the probability that my fixed bad set is contained in a random subspace? Uh, well, it's um, using this assumption that each of the Bs uh, are full dimensional. It's two to the K divided by two to the M, two to the N all raised to the B. Why is that? Well, the probability that a, a single point is contained in a random subspace is two to the k divided by two to the n, because there are two to the k points in my k-dimensional random subspace. There are two to the n points total. And because they're all linearly independent, you know, completely a uniformly random subspace, um, you know, treats those all as independent random variables. So I get to raise it to the b. So that, that's equal to this. Okay, so that's the probability that a fixed bad set is contained in my random subspace, easy to compute. Um, and so then we can just compute the expected number of bad sets in my random subspace is just, okay, the number of bad sets times that probability that we just computed. All right. So to continue carrying out this exercise, we should ask ourselves, um, all right, how do I pick parameters so that this thing is really small? Uh, when we do that, you, you, you solve for it and you get something like this. So you get that if K over N, so the sort of the normalized dimension uh, or the rate of this um, random linear subspace, is less than or equal to one minus uh, log of the number of bad sets divided by b times n minus just a little bit, then uh, the probability that there exists a bad set in my subspace is by Markov's inequality at most the expected number of bad sets in my subspace. And by plugging this thing here into that there, um, this is at most two to the minus epsilon n. Um, and so basically all that I've done here is that I've uh, taken this thing, I'm gonna call this the expectation threshold um, this is what happens when you set this thing equal to one and then just backed off by epsilon. Um, right, so this expectation threshold, this is just the threshold on K over N above which you expect there to be uh, lots of bad sets in V and below which you expect there to be little of one bad sets in V. Okay, um, so that gives us some estimate on the threshold, right? So uh, if, if you believe me that there exists a threshold, um, uh, it says that all right, so I have this expectation threshold here, and I know that if I back off by epsilon from that, then you know with probability uh, close to one, I'm going to avoid all bad sets, sort of up to epsilon minus that. And of course, the natural question is: uh, Is this the right answer? Are we done? This was so easy, um, right? Is it just uh, is that the right answer, or might might it be that you actually have to go a little bit further before you hit the threshold? Um, and what what this sort of thing would mean is that you know the expected number of bad sets in my random subspace is really large, while the probability that there exists a bad set in my random subspace is small. Um, so that would ha happen, for example, if some subspaces V contain tons of bad sets, but most don't contain any or, so or something like that. All right, okay, so which of these is the case? All right, so spoiler alert, um, it's not quite so easy. This does not give the right threshold, but it's almost, almost so easy uh, in the sense that there essentially is a first moment kind of argument behind it. Um, so let me show you an example to, that illustrates that this is not the right threshold, but also illustrates kind of what is the right threshold. All right, so here's an example. Um, so suppose that my collection of bad sets, curly B, is all the coordinate wise permutations of these three uh, vectors. So here little b is equal to three. And I just wanna say, what's the probability that a random subspace avoids any triple of vectors so that a quarter of the coordinates look like one zero zero, a quarter of the coordinates look like one zero one, a quarter of the coordinates look like zero one zero, and a quarter of the coordinates look like zero one one in any order. All right, so simple, simple question. Um, okay, and we can try to do this expectation threshold thing that, that we just did. So let's just work that out. Okay, so how big is the set curly B? Uh, well, it's it's about four to the n. Um, it's not exactly four to the n, but 
cl close enough, right? Because there's there's four possible choices for each coordinate in roughly the same proportions, and it's close enough. So let, let's call it four to the n. Um, so then the expectation threshold of curly B, the of, of this particular uh, collection of bad sets, is just plugging it into what we got on the previous slide: one minus um, the log base two of the size of curly B divided by three n. If you work that out, it's about a third. So the picture then looks like this uh, for this particular thing. Uh, I know that if I look at um, a random subspace of dimension a little bit less than n over three, um, then uh, with high probability, I'm going to avoid all such triples of points. And my question is, is that the right threshold or do I have to go a little bit further? Okay, so I claim I have to go a little bit further. Here's a way to see it. Um, consider the collection curly B prime that I get by dropping this third vector. It's gone. Um, so now this gives me some other collection of bad sets, uh, now of size two. Um, and now I'm interested in the question, uh, how big does the dimension have to be before I avoid this pair, uh, you know, any, any pair of bad, uh, bad vectors that looks like this. So I want to avoid all pairs of vectors where half of the coordinates look like one zero and the other half look like zero one. All right, we can do exactly the same exercise that we did before. Now the size of curly B prime, this uh, collection of pairs of vectors is about two to the n um, for the same reason. And plugging everything in um, this expectation threshold, you know, just doing the same Markov's inequality computation we did before, uh, turns out to be about a half. So what that tells us is that uh, now if you look at subspaces of dimension just a little bit smaller than n over two, which is notably larger than n over three, uh, with high probability, you will avoid all such pairs of bad points. In particular, you're going to avoid all such triples of bad points because uh, whenever you um, avoid such a pair, you avoid such a triple, right? So that gives sort of a lower bound on uh, the probability of avoiding all the triples of bad points, all of my original bad sets. Um, and therefore, this line here can actually extend all the way over to a half minus a little bit. Um, this is very reminiscent of things in uh, random graph theory, in probabilistic random graph theory, where you want to ask the, what's the probability of containing uh, some subgraph, some uh, small constant size subgraph. And sometimes the subgraph is not going to tell you the right expectation threshold. If you look, I mean, this graph you want to contain, sometimes if you remove some vertices or edges, you see that, that it will be um, larger, just like in this in this case. So it's clear that for this calculation, you have to look not just at the bad sets, but um, uh, all sub collections. I mean, let's say it's in your case, it's generated just by one, uh, right? It's one orbit. So it's generated by by one graph, it's like containing a triangle. And right. uh, you have to look not just at the generator, but all subsets of the generator and maximize over that. Exactly. Yeah. So the the thing that's going to be different here so like you were saying in, in random graphs right i need to look not just at the subgraph but basically at all subsets uh, at all subgraphs of that of that subgraph yeah. and i want to say like right sub, you, may, you have to remove edges yeah exactly yeah or yeah that's right yeah yeah look, look at all sort of h primes that that i live in h and say like right the actual threshold is the the worst one so that or sorry i guess the best the best one depending on whose side you're on um, so that uh, the uh, the expected number of any such any such smaller graph is um, is is small or is large. I guess um, it's going to be very very similar here, except we need uh, because we have this linear structure instead of um, I am spoiling the, the next slide. Instead of being, uh, it's not actually quite as simple as just looking at subsets. You actually have to look at linear projections. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically that's basically it, and yeah, exactly an analogy to how it works in random graphs. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. So let me let me uh, state state the um, state the actual thing, and then uh, hopefully the analogy to how it works in random graphs will be even more clear. Um, right. Yeah. So returning to this um, to this situation, like, does this always give the correct threshold? Uh, right. The answer is no, um, which perhaps is exactly what, what you would expect from random graphs. And in fact, it is possible that that this could go a little bit further because of certain substructures that kind of like behave nicer than you think. Right. Um, so here, here's a theorem. So this is a, a characterization of, of this threshold. Um, 
or basically uh, the theorem basically says that this this example is pretty much the only reason that um, the that expectation threshold is is not the right threshold. Um, right. So what was the reason? The reason was that we you know, did a projection to uh, drop one of these vectors. And if our subspace avoids this, uh, this new collection, curly B prime, it also avoids curly B. And it turns out that curly B prime happens to be smaller than you might think, um, aka the expectation threshold is larger than you might think. And hence, by Markov's inequality, you're, you're more likely to avoid it. Um, and so I, I claim that this example is basically the only thing that's going on with like one little bit of generalization. Um, so basically, a, another way to write this example is I, I take my um, my sort of original bad set and I, I draw it as a matrix and I just multiply it by the, the little matrix which drops the last coordinate. Um, I'm going to generalize it just a little bit by replacing that with any old matrix at all. So replace it with any matrix A. Uh, and then I claim that this is this is the only thing that's going on. Um, so a uh, little more precisely, but still with pictures, here's a theorem. Suppose that curly B is a single orbit under coordinate permutations. Then uh, the, uh, the threshold rate, uh, R star, is given by the maximum over all matrices A of the expectation threshold of, uh, I'm just going to draw it like this, basically what happens when you take this single orbit and you project it by A. So, Basically, it says do that trick as well as you can. That will give you the right answer. Um, and then, so that that was just for a single orbit. To generalize to multiple orbits, you just sort of take the the worst possible orbit. So now, let's say you have a collection of sets, uh, a, a a bad collection of sets, which is a union of different orbits under coordinate permutations. Um, then uh, the threshold rate is going to be the minimum uh, over all of those orbits. Of that same of that same quantity for, for each orbit. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, so I have a quick question. So uh, in in random graphs, then subgraph thresholds are actually coarse, and there are other thresholds which are um, sharp. But uh, this does, doesn't seem to happen here. Um, so I think I thought a little bit about this, uh, and my understanding is that this is a sort of threshold that you might call coarse. In the sense that, so it's sharp. It, it's sharp in the sense that, um, uh, well, all right, in, in the sense of that, that picture that I drew sure, sure looked sharp. No, but not, sharp is a technical definition. Exactly. Yeah. It's not, it's not uh, that you add or subtract epsilon. If that's all you do, then it's coarse. If, right. If you move one plus epsilon from the uh, threshold, then it's sharp. So this is relevant to a regime that I don't think is too interesting to you, is when the uh, probability, in this case the rate, uh, is little or one. In coding theory, we mostly look at constant, right? In right. Rates that are uh, constant. So in your in the, your x-axis, you look at the constant k over n, and there it doesn't matter where, whether you add epsilon or multiply by one plus epsilon, it's the same thing. So this is a cold regime. In, in uh, uh, the sharp regime, usually look at properties that are uh, where their threshold is little low one, like one over root 10 or something like that. So uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I think for causing theory, it doesn't look relevant. And anyway, the theorem, uh, yeah, you state seems like if you just add or subtract epsilon, that's a, Standard course regime uh, threshold, even though the picture looks very sharp. <laughs> right. A picture of a threshold behavior. Yeah. Well, so I, I think another way to say it is I guess I, I said if I add or subtract epsilon and then I said like one plus or minus little o of one, I didn't say actually what that are. If you think of it in threshold terms, like you want to go from delta to one minus delta, then the, the width of the that transition turns out to be like, I think it's log n over n or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think that this counts as as coarse. Um, uh, also, one thing is that we're looking at the we're looking at the dimension of the subspace instead of the size of the subspace. Um, I think looking at the size would maybe be more analogous to what you'd call a sharp threshold in, in random graphs. Uh, what I'm, yeah, maybe, but it ju it just yeah, you, you are saying that moving in the in the rate log n over n will change the behavior. But will it happen also if uh, the rate was itself, uh, you know, one over root n? Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Um... 
Okay, I think for a shot threshold, you would expect that it's enough to move it by a constant, to change k by a constant. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's what it would mean to be, I, I think that's what it would mean to be sharp in this regime is if, if instead of, if I went from k to k plus one and that was like all the transition occurred there, but um, I don't think, yeah, but this result does not say that. So therefore, yeah, I, I do agree that it's sort of coarse in the setting. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, yeah, with the, <laughs> uh, the matrix say, I mean, uh, it's not clear when what just one looks at it that it preserves uh, properties that you like, like distance or, uh, I mean, that you can, that, that uh, doing such linear projection, uh, you cannot change the nature of, uh, or you don't care. You don't care whether you are trying to capture decodability or least decodability or whatever, and right, that's what your original set B defines, and then you multiply it by this A, and you get other bad sets that don't capture this property. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and because I'm looking at a linear code, notice that if um, like if I were to contain all of these bad things in, in a linear subspace, then of course I'm going to contain any any projection of it. Um, yeah. Cool. Oh, I'm running out of time. Okay, so let me um, say quickly you're, that you're also running out of time, Mary. This is a relaxed seminar, and if you are asked lots of questions, you don't have to feel pressure. <laughs> okay. Uh, go, go away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so I, I can say more about the, the proof if you want. I have some hidden slides. Uh, the, the only slide I have here is proof idea, second moment method. Um, basically, the right, so we, the proof idea, you need to show two directions, one that the threshold is not less than that, and the other that the threshold is not more than that. So we basically already proved the threshold is not less than that. That's Markov's inequality. Like, how do you show the threshold is not more than that? Um, it's basically just the second moment method and, and follow your nose. Um, pretty much the, I think the difficult part here was coming up with the, um, the right objects to look at, which are these orbits under uh, coordinate permutation, and then also looking at these um, projections. Uh, and, and once you sort of know that that's what you're, what you're trying to prove, um, it's just sort of second moment method and it's, it's not so bad. Um, uh, yeah, and let me also say, I guess, because Avi was asking a bunch about um, random graphs. Um, I do have a hidden slide here about that. Oops. Oh, it looks like screen sharing stops, stops when I go to random slides, or hidden slides. Yeah, so just sort of in, in analogy with, with random graphs, um, let me get my pointer back. Yeah, so like there's a natural question to ask for random graphs, like when is a subgraph H likely to appear uh, in GNP? And the answer is when P is large enough that um, every, uh, I guess, subset uh, H prime of H has in expectation, little omega of one copies in G. And we basically just said the same thing for uh, for subspaces. When is a single orbit uh, sort of local property curly B likely to appear in uh, um, uh, random subspace V? It's, it's when the dimension is large enough so that every sort of linear projection uh, curly B prime of, of B has an expectation omega of one copies in V. So it's, it's a, very, a very similar sort of statement. Um, I think that, yeah. Um, I have a question. So the, do you use anything for this uh, um, second moment argument beyond the fact that uh, linear subspace are sort of pairwise independent? Uh, not really. Um, yeah, I, I can even, I have some hidden slides about the, I mean, not, not, not the whole proof, but the basic idea of the proof. Um, Somehow when I when I give talks in person, you can like go to the hidden slides in like a, a subtle way that makes it seem like they were uh, intended to, but now I need to stop sharing. So it makes it very awkward. So, um, yeah, so the, the basic proof idea, um, right? So we've essentially already shown that the threshold is, is bigger than, than that. Um, and we wanna show the other direction. Um, as that is if um, the, the rate is, it's too big than a random subspace is uh, very likely to contain some bad set. Let me point her back. Um, yeah, and so the the proof idea with the second moment method, um, right? So uh, right, we basically just need to bound the variance 
of uh, the number of bad sets that are contained in a random subspace. Uh, how do we do that? Do we need to bound right, the probability that two bad sets are contained in a random subspace? So what is that probability? Uh, uh, right, so you might first hope, sorry, I made these slides for my uh, randomized algorithms class. Um, you, you, you might first hope that they're independent, um, but of course they're, they're not. Um, uh, you, know, you, you might first hope that the probability that B and B prime are both contained in B is just the product. Um, that's not true. Uh, because if, for example, B and B prime intersect, it's problematic. Um, but this is at most the probability that B is in my subspace times the probability that B prime times some projection matrix A is in my subspace for some A. And basically A is the projection that just sort of projects away from B to like kill, kill the intersection pretty much. And then, um, yeah, like you're saying, it's basically just using independence uh, you know, for um, linearly independent vectors. And the first argument, moment argument we just did uh, shows that these are both small. Right. So it, it's it's very very simple. Um, to do it actually formally, uh, you know, to get all of the to, to, to do it out quantitatively takes like a page maybe. Um, so it's not not really just one line, but uh, this is the basic idea. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's the, the ideas are completely elementary. Um, oops, okay. Uh, right, so in my uh, remaining time, which I guess I've been given permission to go a little bit over, um, <laughs> sound like, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, why we actually cared about, about this uh, statement. I, I think it's like a pretty cool statement in analogy to the random graph statement that, that Avi was mentioning, um, but uh, we actually cared about it for some applications. Um, and the application that we're interested in is uh, the list decodability of random LDPC codes. Uh, and since then, we've actually been able to get a couple of other applications out of it. Um, in particular, uh, getting sort of extremely tight bounds on the list size for random linear binary codes. Uh, we're basically able to pin down the right list size to within one of two possible values uh, using these techniques. And also uh, exponential lower bounds for the list size of uh, on list recovery of random linear codes, which is kind of interesting because it separates random linear codes from completely random codes if you know the coding theory jargon. Um, but the point is to today, what I want to talk about is this this first thing. Um, these other two things are a, a separate paper um, that appeared in Random uh, this year, and so check that out if you're interested. But right now, I want to talk about um, yeah, list decodability of random LDPC codes. All right. So what is an LDPC code? I said this word a couple times, but I haven't defined it. Um, so LDPC stands for low density parity check codes. Uh, so these are error correcting codes that have very fast, unique decoding algorithms. Um, and because of that, you're, they're ubiquitous in both theory and practice. Uh, so before, when I was waving my hands about codes, I said that you know, a sender and a receiver could use these to, to communicate. Um, I didn't say how they would do that algorithmically. And in fact, if they use a random linear code, we'd like the, probably not going to have any efficient algorithms. Um, but if they use a, a code from uh, this ensemble, where V is the kernel of a sparse random matrix, um, random according to some uh, distribution, which are called Gallagher's ensemble, then uh, there's sort of enough structure there that um, the decoder can uh, very, you know, in linear time, very efficiently um, uh, decode the message. Um, right. so, so these are used all over the place. And, and the question that we were interested in is, are they list decodable? So this statement was about unique decoding, which was basically saying if there's small enough error that the point that you want to decode, um, that, 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 that there is a unique answer, then this can be done really efficiently. But what about if there's more error and um, you just want to, I want to return all of the possible code words within some radius of my received word. So I want to return all of the possible points in this random subspace. Um, okay, so unfortunately, I, I'm not going to tell you an algorithm to do this. I don't know one. Uh, I, would, I would like to know one, but we do do a first step, which is to know, like, could such a thing even exist? Like, if, if there's an exponential number of such points, and I'm not going to hope for a linear time algorithm to return them, at least I can show you that there's a constant number of such points. Um, so the, the math question here basically is, uh, if you don't want to think about coding theory jargon, let V be this structured random subspace, so it's the kernel of some random sparse matrix. And I just want to know what is the probability that no uh, capital L points of the subspace V are contained in any Hamming ball of radius PN? Um, and the answer should you know, depend on, on P and L. 
Um, and so it is sort of known what the right answer should be. It's called list decoding capacity. And it's known that random linear codes achieve this or, or nearly achieve this. Um, and uh, one corollary of this uh, characterization that I told you is that actually all of those positive results for random linear codes, that is those positive results for random subspaces actually translate to these very structured random subspaces, the kernels of sparse matrices. So here's a theorem. Suppose you have any B local property, P sub curly B, pick epsilon greater than zero. And suppose that a random subspace of dimension Rn satisfies this B local property with high probability. So that means we're sort of up here in, in this range. Um, then the conclusion is that a random LDPC code, um, so an LDPC code according to this ensemble, uh, of dimension a little bit less than that, um, also satisfies the property with high probability. So basically this says that if I just back off by a little bit, the probability that a, a random um, k-dimensional LDPC code satisfies uh, my property is, is really close to one. Um, in particular, as a corollary, this implies that random LDPC codes are basically optionally list decodable because we already knew those results for random linear codes. Um, like those results are not super easy for random linear codes. And I, I would have thought that they would be much harder uh, for random, uh, random LDPC codes because there's like less randomness to work with and it seems nasty, but it turns out they're just completely for free. Um, you can just translate those results. Um, and in particular, random LDPC codes do achieve list decoding capacity. So they're optimally list decoded. Um, okay, so why is this true? So here's the proof idea. Um, so uh, the proof hinges on a lemma. So here's the lemma. So subject to some fine print, um, the probability that um, a fixed sort of bad set B in curly B is contained in a random LDPC code. So contained in the kernel of such a sparse uh, matrix is roughly two to the minus n minus k times b with a little bit of fudge factor. Um, here, here, this epsilon is something that depends on the sparsity of the, of the uh, matrix. Um, and the important thing about this value is that except for this one minus epsilon, this is basically the same as it was for a random linear code when we computed it back there when we were just doing this Markov's inequality thingy. Um, so I claim that that means we're done. So why are we done? Uh, Okay, so if, if curly B is unlikely to appear in a random linear code, then what we showed with this characterization is that essentially there's a first moment reason why that's true. Um, right, like it's you apply Markov's inequality to some projection of curly B, that that will explain why that is the, the right threshold, or what, that'll explain why, why curly B is un, unlikely to appear in a random linear code. Um, but then that same first moment reason is going to hold for random LDPC codes because the, the probability that any fixed bad set is contained in a random LDPC code is basically the same um, as for a random linear code. And so if you're just using Markov's inequality, that's all you need. All right, so the same first moment reason holds for a random LDPC code. And so therefore, uh, curly B is, is also unlikely to uh, be represented in a random LDPC code at the end. So, so that's that's the, the whole proof, basically. Um, the, there's a little bit of difficulty in, in proving this lemma and sorting out the fine print. Um, I guess a, a real quick overview of, of how you prove the lemma, right? Basically, uh, we want to know what's the probability that a fixed matrix B is contained in a random LDBC code, right? What's the that's the same as asking, what's the probability that a fixed matrix B when multiplied by a random sparse matrix is equal to zero? Um, and it turns out that you know, a pretty um, straightforward Fourier analytic type of, of argument will, will get this for you, right? Let's just look at one, uh, one row here. Um, like what, what happens for this thing to be zero, though that means that the sum of a bunch of random rows of B happened to sum to zero. Um, and so uh, if you assume that the span of the columns of B don't contain any uh, sort of low weight or I guess overly low weight or overly high weight non-zero vectors, um, then a Fourier analytic argument pretty readily implies that uh, it's not very likely that the sum of a bunch of random rows is zero. Um, and so it, you know, about uh, two to the minus b times one minus epsilon, where epsilon depends on you know, a bunch, the, how many rows you take, which depends on the sparsity of this, this random matrix. Um, right, so that means that basically uh, we're fine as long as these sets b don't contain any like really low weight uh, code words in their span. But separately, we know that random LDPC codes actually do have this good distance property that we said earlier, so that we can actually ignore those uh, sets B that do have low weight non-zero vectors in their span, um, and then we're done. Um, yeah. 
Oh, and, and that that's enough to, to prove um, this theorem. So there's this sort of technical lemma about just particular sets being contained in a random LTPC code. And then just like, eh, it's all Markov's inequality from there. Um, and then you're done. Um, cool. Okay, I, I'm not even going that too much over. All right, so let, let me conclude real quick. Um, so just to recap, um, so I, I started by asking like what local properties are satisfied by random subspaces with high probability or sort of what, what is the threshold dimension for these properties? Um, I, I asserted that, that local properties have thresholds. And in fact, the proof of this comes out of a proof of the characterization of the threshold, um, which uh, turns out to be um, quite simple. And um, as Avi pointed out, analogous to uh, the, the situation for random graphs. Um, and then uh, the, the reason why we originally cared is that this has some applications to list decoding random LDPC codes. In particular, it implies that any nice properties that hold for completely random subspaces just for free, you can kind of carry over to um, the kernel of, of sparse matrices, uh, AKA LDPC codes. So you can prove new combinatorial results about um, low density parity check codes. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, so let me note, just note a few open questions. Um, so one open question is uh, sort of other applications of this characterization. So I mentioned that we, we had a few more other than this LDPC one, but all the ones that I'm likely to think of are, are in coding theory. I'd be curious if there's some applications elsewhere. Um, and then the other big question that's uh, sort of left open by, by our application to LDPC code is actual algorithms for list decoding LDPC codes. So we showed that such algorithms might exist in that, uh, you know, there's uh, only a constant number of points that you're supposed to return when you're doing list decoding. You know, you're supposed to return all of the points in a Hamming ball. And I, I, I just told you that there's probably not too many, uh, but actually finding them efficiently are ideally in linear time. Uh, I, I don't know how to do that. I think it's a great question. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. What's the property of LDPC? Do you need that, uh, like, if it works for, like for uh, free query LDPC codes or it uh, should be uh, some minimum number of ones uh, that you need in every row. How, how uh, sparse can be, they be? Great question. Yeah, it's like how sparse does it need to be? Hang on, I think I have a hidden slide with the quantitative theorem. Because it's like looks too good to be true if it's like for any sparsity. Uh, yeah, so it, it should be con cons. Uh, wait, hang on. Let me just get the um, get the theorem up. Oh. Well, anyway, it seems that the sparsity will determine the epsilon. You, if you want epsilon to go to zero, you need to take the sparsity to go to infinity with it. So, oh, okay. Right, you are sampling, uh, you know, whatever. I don't know what the number of non-zeros per, uh, per row, but you are sort of doing a, an exclusive or lemma for, um, yeah, if K is a sparsity, you are, doing, you are adding K positions and you want this to this probability to go to zero. Yeah, so I guess it depends on whether or not you, yeah, you think of epsilon as a constant or you think of epsilon as... Uh, but even, even if you do, then uh, you need the sparsity to increase, right? There's a uh, trade of, I mean, if the sparsity is K and epsilon is epsilon, then if you want epsilon to become small, K needs to become large. That's right, yeah. Um, so here, here's the, the formal dependence. Um, so here S, S is the sparsity, um, or S naught is the sparsity. Uh, Q is the size of the field. Um, uh, R bar is the rate of the code. So think of that as a, as a constant. Um, and so then also think of this denominator here as a constant. Um, and think of B as a constant as well, and Q is a constant. So if all those things are constant, then S should be depend like logarithmically on one over epsilon. Okay. Um, does that does that answer the question? Yes, yes, sure. Um, uh, other, yeah, more more questions? Can yeah, I... more questions to Mary. I guess we went straight to the. Yeah, so I, I have a question. So, uh, do you expect algorithms to exist all the way to the threshold, or do you believe that there's a gap there? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'd settle for something like right now. I'd settle for something like solidly more than half the distance, uh, to be honest, um, but. Uh, Wait, I, I, I kind of, I kind of do expect them to exist all the way up to the threshold, but I have no, no reason to expect them to exist all the way up to the threshold other than um, optimism. Uh, I see. Okay, thanks. Thank you. More questions. 
So I have another one, uh, Mary. I, uh, the, the threshold for uh, constant least decodability and for unique decodability uh, for random linear codes is the same, is one minus eight. Uh, sorry, so the threshold for, sorry, for, say it again. For, for unique decoding versus the um, least decoding as you define it with a uh, hundred. Uh, oh, points. no, it, it, it's one minus H of something, but the something is different. Um, yeah, the something is different and you get the same improvement for LDP sequence. Uh, yes, that's right. No, okay. Yeah. Not great. More questions? Um, can I have a small question? Um, it's maybe irrelevant, but uh, is can you get R star as the eigenvalue of some, it, it seems like you take it as a maximum or a min max of something that kind of looks like a rally quotient. So, uh, or one minus log of a rally quotient. So it may, it seems like there's there is some chance there is some kind of uh, that that the R star is some eigenvalue of some operator that should be related to the to the uh, B an operator that, that describes the uh, that describes the property. That I is. Wonder. A... Yes, sorry. No, no, I, it's, I'm just asking if, if it's something that you were looking at or thinking of. Um, but that seems like the, these are kind of tools that, uh, that can be related. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, yeah, I definitely see what you mean. I, I haven't thought about it. Uh, so it, yeah, it, it might be the case that you, you could describe it that way, but um, yeah, I, I haven't thought about it at all. <laughs> You need to find the entropy function as an eigenvalue of some matrix if you are doing this, uh, Leo. Yeah. So do you know one? No, I'm I'm thinking about it, but just I'm 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 just thinking what what's the translation between those properties and the operators that you're looking at their eigenvalues. If there's some because this would this would be maybe it'd be a good and a nice way of characterizing those R stars as, as a, I don't know, first or a second or third eigenvalue of a, of a certain uh, operator. Uh, and but, uh, <laughs> just just throwing it there. Yeah, it would be interesting. I, I, I don't, I haven't thought about it. I don't know how to, yeah, it seems, yeah, I have to think about how to set it up. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good question. More questions. All right, Mary, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks everyone for your, for your great questions and for.